Okay, so yesterday we looked at the start of files. Basically, if you think of files as a stream of characters, like I was saying to you guys yesterday, you can think of a text file like this as really a stream of characters streaming in. Sound effects, yes. Including the spaces, spaces are characters. Including the new line characters. Remember we talked about that yesterday, that that is actually two characters. Does anyone remember what the two characters were? There'd be a prize. And no, kids. The answer is a carriage return and a line feed. See? At least the sound effects are waking you guys up this morning. Okay, and then another carriage return line feed. And then one other character at the end. Does anyone remember what that one was called? The end of file marker. Okay? But essentially, you can think of a file as a collection of these characters. Now, what else does this look like that you already know about in programming? Where you have a, a long string of things collected together. Starts with an A and ends in a Y. An array, yeah. Similar, but not the same. Okay. So, a file is defined as persistent data. Persistent because it sticks around, okay? Computers will store persistent data on storage device, specifically secondary storage devices such as a disk drive, okay? The processing of these persistent data is necessary so that your software can go beyond just software that runs once. So in other words, it can remember things for the next time it runs. Like, for example, a set of high scores would be in a game. Um, so in Java, this idea of processing data as a stream is a big part of what Java uses um, for a lot of things. Stream handling is a big part of what's going on here. So I'm just going to... Uh, Turn this over to a uh, diagram for a second. I'll show you what I mean. Okay. So in Java, you essentially have your code accessing a stream. So again, you can think of these as like streams of water, right? But there's more than one, and they're streaming different places. So Java has connections to streams. Strum, some streams connect to files. Okay. So in other words, you can dump your data into the stream, and it'll go and get into a file. One of the streams you already know. It's called the system. That's when you first learned Java. You used system.out. You were accessing what's called the default output stream. You were streaming like a string of data to output to just pop it up on the screen. Now, these streams can have all kinds of places. For example, networks, right? If you want to connect one computer or another, that's a sort of stream. The internet can be a stream. So there's all kinds of stream things that Java can access that we can then tap into. And you've tapped into one of them already. You've tapped into the system object. But now we need an object to tap into to connect to files. Now when I said the word object, okay, what did I mean by that? What is an object in Java? What's another word that's related to object? Starts with a C. It's a class. <laughs> Sleep at the wheel today. A class and an object are essentially the same thing. The class, as you may have recalled from last year, is the template, and the objects are instances of that class. What are the two main things that every class has built into it? One of them is properties, and the other one is methods. Either you guys don't want to talk today, or you don't, or just not really following this today. Okay, so we need a class object to access files, and that's what we're going to use. So we're going to use these objects to manipulate the files and connect into them, but Important with this is the idea that we are streaming to data. Okay? So if you can grasp that concept, you can apply the streams in different ways. Okay? Okay, so it's a stream of data that has a marker at the end called the end of file marker. Okay? And you will write code to file that way and you will open code from file that way. Okay? 
And there are street, three basic stream objects in Java, system.in, system.out, and system.error for errors. You've used system.out before. That was one of the first things you ever did in Java. System.in actually allows you to do basic inputs, but it's not as easy to use as, as you'd think. So I actually started your basic inputs with the J option pane, because again, as well, you guys want to start diving into graphics a little bit. Okay? So streams allow you to communicate between a Java program and something else. That something else could be a physical device, like a disk drive. It could be a connection to some sort of network. Okay? So system.in connects to a keyboard. System.out connects to a monitor or your screen. Okay? But you can redirect these streams, which is what we're going to do. So one of the stream objects we're going to use comes from java.io. Okay, time for you guys to shine now. You've been missing so many questions I've been asking. So here's one. What would I-O stand for? Not on, no. That would be O-O. -O. We're talking about files. What would I-O stand for? Close. Input, output. Input, output. Okay. Okay. To access this, we're going to use two class objects. One's called a file reader. One's called a file writer. Okay. These two objects will connect to our file. Okay. And the reason we need two objects is partially because once we start accessing a physical device like a disk drive, we are actually working in a much slower environment than we would normally in our code in general. Because when we launch the code that you guys have been writing, all of it goes up to the computer's memory and just runs that way. But now that we're actually accessing a disk drive, which actually spins using motors, although it spins very fast, it doesn't spin fast enough for us. So we need kind of a two-part connection to this object so that we don't have to wait for it. We can kind of store stuff temporarily and keep our code running. So that's part of the reason why. And part of that is through what's called a buffer object. Now, you may or may not have heard of that term before. Has anyone ever heard the word buffer as it relates to computers? I bet you at least one of you has. Because I bet you some of you have been on YouTube in the last few years. And what does it say when a video isn't loaded up yet often? It says it's buffering, right? Buffers are sections of memory that are essentially waiting lines while it's waiting to get something done. So because we're accessing files and it might be slow, we'll be using an object called a buffer object. Okay? Okay, so the objects we'll be using when we um, read from files will be the buffered reader object and the print writer object. Okay? However, before we do any of this, we need to take a second to talk about errors. Okay, so here's kind of what I was just saying in summary. You're going to write your code to do something. I don't care what it is. Let's say it's a game. And over here, let's say you have a disk drive um, where you're going to save a file. So you're going to save a file to that physical disk drive. So you need to have your code stream your data over there. So actually, let's say you wrote a poem, like I said before. The cat sat. This data file is going to get saved over there. Okay? Well, we're going to need a couple things to do this. Just like if you were saving Microsoft Word, what's the very first thing it asks you? What do you want to call it, right? So let's say we want to call it poem.txt. Okay? So we need to have a file name. We need to have that so that it will save on there. We also need all the data. Okay? So this is the data that we're going to save in there. So we have all the data and the file name itself. And then these things, in theory, will get saved to that thing. And then later, if we want to, say, work on it again, we also want to pull it back so we can open the file. So this would be saving the file. This would be opening the file. So far, I'm not telling you guys anything revolutionary. Okay? 
But what happens in the middle here is we were accessing classes to do this. And there's actually, as I said before, two classes that do this. Not one, but two. Okay? And again, the reason is because of this idea of buffering. So that we have one kind of as a temporary and then one that actually accesses it. We don't need this with objects that aren't as slow. But disk drives, physical drives, that actually have motors in them that spin around can be slow. Okay? So, some of the objects we'll be using is to save, okay, we will use what's called a print writer. Okay? And a file writer. Okay? We will also be using a file reader. Here's the question. What will this missing one be? Print writer and file writer will save. File reader and if you think it's print reader, you'd be a good guess, but wrong. It's actually called a buffered reader. Okay? That's that, the word buffer coming into play here. Okay, so let's, um, let's think about that. So all of this is going to be working. But, here's the big but. All of this code that's going on in here is potentially very, very dangerous to your computer system. Code that you've written to this point, if it did something wacky inside there, like caused an error, would not be a big deal because it was just your software loaded up in memory. So if it caused some kind of error, it would just crash, and then your, your, the Microsoft Windows that's running in here would just keep going as it is. But now we're actually changing something permanent, right? Remember, this was called persistent storage which is permanent. Or um, non-volatile was a word I used yesterday. Okay? So the fact that we're doing that, when we're messing with files, Java goes, whoa, 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 whoa. If you're going to mess with files, I need your code to be more secure than the regular code. So we need around all of this, what's called an error trap, okay? And it is exactly what it says it is. You set a trap for any potential errors that could happen. And what do traps do? What do mice, mouse traps do? They catch things. They catch potential errors. So this trap is set in case there's an error. So I have to talk a little bit about error traps or error handling before we get into files, okay? So let me just uh, quickly just show you an example of this in Java, okay? So this is called error traps or exception. Exception means error handling. An exception is an error, obviously, in your code. And Java uses a format that came from C++, is extremely similar, okay? There are all kinds of errors you can set traps for, not just files. You can, for example, set traps for running out of bounds in an array, for having a variable overflow its contents, for a piece of math that where you'd make a division by zero, um, using methods with invalid parameters, running out of memory in general. All the kinds of errors that you could normally encounter can actually be set traps for. What this means is your code doesn't necessarily have to crash when it hits this error because you can trap it and deal with it. So I'm just starting you on the idea of error trapping. This might be something you may want to incorporate into something like your final project. And the other one, the one that we need to work on, is file errors trapping. Okay? So there's a couple words you need to know about error handling. One of them is the word throw. When it catches an error, it throws it to another piece of code. It's like throwing a football. It says, oh, we just had an error. Stop what we're doing. Throw it over here and take care of it. Okay? So when you throw something, you also need to catch it. So the error is caught and thrown and handled using these types of terminologies. Okay? So to do this, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce something called a try block. A try block is a keyword 
that just tries some code. That sets the trap, okay? And then it's caught with a catch block. So the block of code just says try, and in there you put all the code that could potentially have an error, and then you have a block that says catch, whereas if an error occurs, it will catch it and do something down here. So that something might be popping up a little message box saying a big error has occurred, but your whole program will not crash. It'll catch the error. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna do that in the example. Okay. All right. So now I'm just gonna show you that these lines of code that are used in the notes here will be used to actually access the file. But now it's time. Let's get started on our example. So I need everyone to open up NetBeans. Now here's another big tip for everyone. Um, in the last unit recursion. I, and the, I didn't get a lot handed in from some of you. The example I do with you is something you could hand in for marks if you don't actually do a programming problem. Why not just hand in the example? If nothing else, it'll give you some points. Some of you have zero points right now. It's going to be very hard to get the credit in the end if that stays that way. Okay? Okay, so let's set up a project. Um, file, example something like that and you can have it create a main class as well that's fine this is not going to be a graphical example this will be a non graphical example okay Okay, so what we need to do is set up a bunch of data to save to a file. So let's store it in an array. Okay, so you may recall this is how you make an array. You use the square brackets to define it as an array, not a regular object. And you use the curly brackets to define the contents. So let's make it a three-line poem, the cat comma, sat on the, on the mat, period, okay? And I'm just going to move that down so it looks like this. Okay. So, you can imagine that this is the data file, okay? And that after each, at the end here, there'd be a new line character. There isn't now, but right now I'm storing it as an array. So it's a three spot array, like that. And each of these strings is in each spot in the array, okay? So the cat sat on the mat, period are going to be in the three slots of the array, okay? So all right, what we're going to write is code to save this to a file, save the array to a file, and then later read it back from the file to make sure that it read properly, okay? Now, we didn't have to use arrays. We could have used anything. We could have just used one long string of data. But I just thought it would be a good chance to review arrays as well while we're here. And I'm going to also, for those of you who do not feel comfortable with arrays, because I'm going to be starting that with the grade 11s in a few minutes, it's a chance for you to review arrays in general. Okay? Okay. So as I said before, when you save a file, one of the first things you're going to need is a file name. Okay? Now, obviously, we're not going to leave that as empty quotes forever, but I'm just going to get started with this. And then we'll actually write code to save it. But we're not going to write the code here. Okay, I'm not going to just dump code right here because that's not good organization. Okay, better organization would be to write a method that does this. Even better code than that, than to just write a method, would be to first make a class that has a method in it that can save data all the time. Why? Because then I can reuse the class in 
multiple programming projects. Okay? Not just the method. That's something I taught the 11s just now, that if they take methods from program to program, that reduces their workload. Well, they don't know about classes yet. You guys should know that classes allow you to do this. So here's what I'm going to propose. We're going to make a class called File Handler. That's going to be the name of the class. Dot, and we're going to put a method in it called Save. And we're going to pass it the data and the file name, and it will save this data to that file. But at this point, it has no idea what this class is, so we're going to have to tell it what that class is, and it won't know what that method is, so we'll get to that in a second. It's okay, leave the error, that's fine. So now that we have that, we've thought that there's going to be this class with a method built into it for saving. Let's go back up a line, and let's put file name here as well, or sorry, file handler. That'll be our class there. Dot, and we'll make a method called get file name. Okay. So as well built into this class will be a method that returns a file name. And for that, we'll actually ask our user, please enter a name to save this file. And that'll be a nice way to get a name for the for the name of the file. So if they want to call it poem, they'll call it poem, whatever. Rather than just type the name in, we're going to ask our user to get involved here. And again, rather than put all the code right here, I'm going to build it into this class. It'll keep things a little more organized. Okay, so let's say that works. Let's say it saved it. Now let's try going the other way. Now let's try to open that file. So just like when you're in Microsoft Word, when you want to open a file, the very first thing it does is it asks you which file you're going to open. So let's use the same variable. File name equals file handler dot get file name again. Okay, but right here, before I go and do anything, these two methods should not essentially seem the same to you. Because right here, when I'm getting a file name, I'm getting it for saving. And right here, when I'm getting a file name, I'm getting it for opening. In some way, we should distinguish between the two different things that are going on here. Now, we could write a method called get file name for save and get file name for open. We could, we could change it up that way. But another way we could do this is just add a parameter to this a parameter that could indicate whether or not we're saving or opening. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to right here in quotes put the word save and down here put the word open. Okay? So this will now be a parameter of this method that indicates whether I'm getting a file name for saving or whether I'm getting a file name for opening. It's essentially the same thing, but I'll show you later why I'm going to do that. Okay, so let's say that the file now needs to get opened up, needs to actually be opened on my screen. If it's opened, it should return a bunch of data. A bunch of data should come back. This time, why don't we get our data back as just a big string of text? Equals file, oops, my apologies, file handler dot open the file name. Okay, and then finally, to just make sure this worked, let's output that text to our screen to see if this actually did something. Okay, so I know there's got a ton of errors here, but I just want to kind of show you what would theoretically be going on here. So we start with this array called data. It has three slots, spot 0, 1, and 2. And inside it is the cat sat on the mat, period. So that's what's sitting in that array. Okay? What we then do is we call a method. We have this big class that we're going to build called file handler. Okay? 
And inside of it, one of the methods is called get file name. That's one of its methods. But that method requires a parameter right there. And so I use that method with the parameter save. So what it's going to do is it's going to bring up a, a, we'll bring up a sort of a dialog box where the user types in the name of a file. And then that name will be returned to here. It will be returned and stored in that variable. So then this file name variable will contain the name of the file, we'll say poem.txt. We talked a little bit yesterday about how the name of a file is more complicated than just that. OK, but so let's say that worked. OK, so now that's stored in there. Now we have another method in this class called save, which takes two parameters. It takes this data as a parameter, and it takes the file name as a parameter. It takes all that data and the name of the file, and what it should do is it should write this stuff to that file on the actual hard drive of the computer. So somehow this will actually write that on there. And hopefully it should work. Okay? That's the idea. That's what we're going to build into it. Okay, so then that's done. So it saved the file. That's great. Then it calls this method again. This time it feeds the word open into this. And now, file name, the user will be asked, what file do you want to open? We should ask for the same name just, just to be sure that it worked. So we'll reopen the same name of the file we just saved, though we theoretically could open any file. So we'll open this file. And then we'll call a method called open from this class. And open takes the file name as a parameter. Okay. What open should do is it should access that file on the hard drive. But as well, open will return right here a whole bunch of text. What text? All of this text will get returned because it will open that file up. And then lastly, just to make sure it worked, I'll spit that text out to the screen. So our task at hand is to write these methods, save, open, and get file name, within a class that we're going to build called file handler. So we're going to build a class called file handler that has those three methods in it. And again, the reason why I made it into a class is for more reusability. So that you guys, in theory, could take this whole class with you and solve problems, or even take that whole class with you and work on it for a final project. Now, it's possible that we're also going to build more methods than that into it. But again, rather than just have this example sit standalone as just an example, if you get a little bit more organized with your code, you want to be able to reuse code as much as possible. OK. So let's just get a quick start at this. You can actually build a whole class just using the light bulb. Notice when, when you bring that up, whoops, when you bring that light bulb up right there, I can't bring it in, but one of the options is to create classes. Okay? Now, another option there is to do an import, which would actually import a class that's already written. We don't want to do that because that's not the class we're looking for. Okay? Then it has three different options, create class in package, and then some other ones. We actually want to use the second option, create class file handler in package. And what it does is it goes into your code and builds a class. So now when you look at your project window, it should now have two Java files in there. Because it's just built a whole Java file for you in the package. So that's handy that it did that for us. We jump back to the other one now. And now it, it doesn't have a problem with you using the word file handler anymore because the class itself is built. But now it has no idea what this method is. So once again, you can use the light bulb and create the method. And do that again with save. Use the light bulb, create the method. And then finally go to here to open. Use the light bulb and create the method. And that will clear up all your errors in main. 
But now all your work is here in File Handler. Because now here in File Handler, it has now created the class, and it's created the three methods that this class needs to work. Now some of them are return methods, which is why they're giving you an error right now. Like this get file name should return a string, and open should return a string. So for now, just so it won't yell at me, I'm just going to put the words return null in there, just for now just so it stops yelling at me. Okay, so here again you can use NetBeans itself to help automate some of your tasks so you're not the one just writing the code, that it can help do a lot of this for you. Okay, we're going to stop there for today. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about why these methods have the word static on there and a few other things, but we'll just stop there for today.